Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv, here with the last of the spooky season episodes for the year. Ugh, tragic as that may be, but frankly, it makes my life a lot easier if I don't have to find spooky things amongst all the ridiculousness that is Greek myth. Today's episode is really exciting. I'm talking witches. In this episode, I spoke with Maxwell Paul, who wrote the book on Rome's first witch, Canidia, uh, and that's why he was the perfect person to talk to. Um, plus, we're just Twitter friends, and it was fun. Uh, so we had a really, really interesting and entertaining conversation about Roman witches and Greek witches, and interestingly, the way these two concepts diverge, because to me, they're notably incredibly different in a really fascinating and bizarre kind of way. We talked about Canidia, who I'd never heard of, but who is both a comedic and bizarre and also scary and weird witch from uh, Horace's poetry in Rome. Honestly, so fascinating. We also talked a lot about the underworld and everything to do with that, as well as mystery cults, lots of different spooky season kind of things. It was just really fun, and witches are super cool, and I fucking love them, and happy fucking spooky season! <laughs> You'll note that there's also a poem, an epode, by Horace that we talk about in this episode about Canidia, the creepy one, the creepy poem about Canidia. And Maxwell gave me the privilege of being able to read his translation of it. It was really fun and creepy and dark, so stay tuned for that reading at the end of the episode. Conversations, Sorceresses and Satire, Witches of Ancient Greece and Rome with Maxwell T. Paul. Witches. I'm so excited to talk to somebody who knows more than the minimum that I have found in the like two or three books that I have. So yeah, witches in the ancient world. Yeah, witches are fantastic. Yeah, they're amazing. And I know the mythological ones super well and how limited, you know, the sourcing is on somebody like Hecate. I don't know what the best way to pronounce her name is these days, but... That'll work. Yeah, she, you know, she's amazing. People want episodes about her all of the time. And I'm like, I if there was more, I would tell you. I promise I'm not holding Absolutely. anything back. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you want a do you want a two-line scrap that mentions her? Mm, you yeah. Don't, you that's don't want the that. thing. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I'm like, I swear to God, I've covered everything possible, people. I'm not yep. holding back. And then there's the like when she shows up in Hesiod, you're mm. like, this is not this is not expressly the witchy content you were all looking for. You're like, oh, like your harvest of fishes is more exciting today. Like, cool. That's not, no one showed up for that. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like when she's just all about, you know, crossroads or whatever. I'm like, well, I mean, cool. Not the witchy stuff that people want for spooky season. Yeah. 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 So yeah. What are, who are the witches that you've studied? So... No, and you're you're not wrong. And then, like, if you're looking at witches in antiquity, like they're kind of the biggies, right? Like, mm -hmm. you, you've got Hecate as the sort of divine witchy overseer kind of thing, if we're being very general. Um, but right there's Medea, there's Circe. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite is Canidia, mm. um, which, if you do a Google search, it either corrects to Canada or canidiensis which is the technical term for a yeast infection oh lovely cannot recommend <laughs> yeah uh-huh love googling ancient words <laughs> mm -hmm. so good you got canidia and then the other like big well-known one is erichtho um mm. in lucan's civil war 
Um, and after that, like you've kind of got like these minor sketches, maybe they're unnamed. Um, what's his face? Uh, Theocritus has a witch, uh, as does Virgil. Uh, but right. Like they're not, they're not the super cool, exciting witches you're looking for. Like you, you kind of get these little thumbnail sketches and that's, that's what there's to go on. Mm -hmm. I was actually just looking at the Theocritus one, uh, because I don't know if it was you. Somebody sent it to me on Twitter as possible, like reading material for oh, the show. Oh, fun. That was not just, me, but yeah. Okay. Somebody, I can't believe I've already forgotten who it was because it was like last week. Thanks, Twitter oh. person. <laughs> yeah, Twitter's best. Um, but yeah, because it's like a love spell kind of yeah, thing, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that one's quite interesting, but it still is. not a lot. No. Um, and I, I have to confess to my students. So I just, I taught uh, a course on witches. Uh, in the Greek and Roman world um, last year. Time is weird because of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I taught this class and I had to confess that I'm like, okay, Theocritus wrote this poem and then Virgil sort of has his own take on it. And they're so similar that I can never keep them separate. Mm. Like they're not, it's not like a shot for shot remake, but it's real close. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know what that there's, they're in love with somebody and they would like that person to come back to them, like as an insight into sort of sexual mores and or social practices. Fascinating. But as for mm -hmm. like witchcraft, it's, yeah, it's much more love magic and much less spooky season, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 And I mean, as, a, as somebody who focuses a lot on, you know, women and feminism in Greek myth, like my favorite thing is not women lo like longing after men and, and, you know, well, and I should clarify like men writing about women who yeah. are longing after men. Absolutely. Yeah, not my favorite genre. <laughs> Absolutely. Though. So, all right. So I'm going to, I might be wrong here. Cause again, I haven't read this in it's a hot minute, but if I remember correctly, a cool thing about the Theocritus bit mm -hmm. is that we do have an unmarried woman mm. expressing sexual desire which is neat, right? Like, yeah, that's like rare. All of the, all, all of the misogyny and patriarchy aside, like it is exceedingly rare to like have a woman actually be like, no, 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 this guy's hot, and I should like this to continue happening, and I'm sad that it didn't. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I digress. Sweetie no, but that's a good here. point. That is yeah. a good point. Maybe yeah. I'll save it for like Valentine's season. Yeah, and read it then. Yeah. Sure, it's not spooky. I mean, no, it's maybe my version of Valentine's. <laughs> it's not spooky. I did mention the like the legit creepiest thing that I've seen in most of Latin literature is not a witch, but it's still uh, still ghostly, mm. right? So. Um, Tibullus, who are you at all familiar with Tibullus? I don't think so. Mm, you no, know, he's no one's favorite, right? Like I have, I have the source book that I assume is one of the only source books when it comes to you know witches. Daniel and magic. Ogden's. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yep, of course. I'm like I, I imagine there's not a ton of those. Um, and so I, I covered a lot from that last year, I sure. think. So it's possible I covered this and I'm already forgetting. Um, but I'm, yeah, <laughs> I would be very surprised if it shows up. I could be wrong. Okay. I don't know. Ogden is encyclopedic, nothing else. Mm -hmm. So this is a guy being like, I'm in love with you. And by the way, his his love interest name is Nemesis. Oh, that's good. That's mm -hmm. a good it's sign. Great. It's a great sign. Yeah. Um, he's like, oh, like, I'm so in love with you. I go to your dead sister's grave. And <laughs> I like, I cry by her grave and you should know that like she's not going to put up with you rejecting me for too long so you better be careful right like it's it's so it's so manipulative but ultimately he's like so yeah you'd better sort of stop rejecting me otherwise the ghost of your dead sister is going to hang out by your bed while you sleep and she's going to look all bloody and gross, just like how she did when she fell out of a window to her death. And you're like, what the fuck? What the actual fuck, Tobolus? Like, it was weird enough that you're like, I've been praying by your dead sister's grave. And now you're like, she's, she's going to be all mangled and disgusting, like how she was in her death. And it haunt, yeah. That's mm -hmm. both 
hilarious and horrifying. Correct. Correct. Right? So all the witchy <laughs> stuff where people are like, I will rip apart your body. You're like, oh, yeah, I get it. Like, I'm in a horror show. But, like, having this <laughs> just creep into an otherwise, like, erotic love context is super weird. Yeah. Don't approve. No. <laughs> that sounds like... Now, and this might be my bias coming through, but that sounds really Roman. Like, I mean, yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, it, I know it is Latin, but also, like, it just sounds, it sounds Roman, and it's sort of darkness, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it really, it really is. The other standout as far as, like, very creepy women is Erichtho. She is the subject of easily, it's like 150 lines, um, where Lucan is just like, how can I describe the weirdest most impious witchy person ever and you're like all right well, let's see what you do and as you know he lucan is writing very much in the shadow of virgil's aeneid so just how our hero aeneas gets to go visit the underworld in book six and see uh the sibyl who is kind of witchy in that she can predict the future, but we would just probably call her a prophetess. Anyway, Lucan is like, nah, in my dark world, we're going to have Erichtho also in book six, and we're going to get a prophecy just like Aeneas got, but it's going to be dirty and grotesque. And like, okay, cool. I see, the, I see the imagery. I see what we're doing. <laughs> Wonderful. Carry on, sir. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's over the top, right? Like Erichtho can't bear the light of day so she has to sleep in a tomb um <laughs> right like i i can't remember if she's braiding snakes in her hair but you know it's something snakes are very key um and mm -hmm. she's unwashed and then we just run through like she's going to steal the flame from pyres for her dark deeds all right okay that's bad she'll also kill people if she if she needs a body she's gonna kill people you know like, oh i mean okay we're getting a little darker it then talks about her like cutting open pregnant women and like taking their babies lovely correct yeah. or like uh pulling up realizing like i'm making a crucified symbol <laughs> it's fine uh it's for, for the podcast this is a wonderful <laughs> imagery um but yeah so when there are people that have been crucified Lucan talks about Erichtho like climbing up the crucifix and like pulling on their bodies with her teeth. It's I really love gross. her. It's, yeah, she sounds yeah. amazing. She's she's incredible. <laughs> um, and after all of this, the prophecy that she eventually gets by like resurrecting a guy and like washing his innards with moon juice, it's a shit prophecy. Um, like it's just it's not worth all of the effort. And she's just like, oh, well. <laughs> That's what you get. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Do you have a favorite witch on your own? Um, Medea, I guess. Sure, yes. Yeah. Tell because, me more. I mean, I, you know, I've made this point a lot. I'm not defending murder, but I love everything she does, mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily see anything wrong with it. No, I mean, I do, and I know, you know, she only kills her kids in Euripides' version, so maybe if we go elsewhere then i'm fine with all of what she does her sure. brother is an unfortunate you know side <laughs> problem you gotta go you gotta go yeah. i mean i think what it is is that i like like i recently read the argonautica for the podcast oh. and oh, okay yeah like read it aloud because i do reading episodes yeah. when i can't fit in conversations um and it but i also have to read public domain translations Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so they tend to be uh very old and stuffy and the first book i or section i read i i didn't do any kind of like in the moment translating of my own and then i kind of realized it would be easy for me to change certain words to just sure. like modern english yeah you know yeah, yeah you instead of thou and like it's not that hard oh, to do Lord. that in the moment mm -hmm. so yeah but you know the first couple books were like pretty boring to read aloud but then when you get to medea like her stuff in the argonautica is actually incredible it's really good it's so good and then i also i just love that she is explicitly under like a spell by a goddess you know like it's it's very clear in the argonautica that it if it weren't for it's got to be hera right or aphrodite but uh, something like this yes yeah if it weren't for that like, she wouldn't be doing all this. She wouldn't love Jason like that. She wouldn't think that he was all that because he's 
ultimately not. Like he is objectively boring. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. I love it because it's like it really takes away her. I mean, like it takes away her agency, but it takes away her agency when it comes to like all the murder that she did. So it's just an interesting, it shows her power and her abilities while also still kind of keeping her morally clean. I don't oh, know. I just think it's really interesting. Like it, it's just, it's very clear that she, I mean, and you know, you can't necessarily pull that all the way to no. Euripides' play, but, yeah. but at least in the Argonautica it's really like she is fully under the influence of him. It's really clear that he could not have done it without her, but also that she would not have necessarily made these decisions were it not for the goddess's like spell. So Pindar also makes it clear in, I think one of his Pythian odes, I can't remember that she is under a spell. Like Jason actually wields the, the magic yunks or something like this. Mm. Um, Right, which is neat and brings into questions is like, wait a second, like I thought Medea was supposed to be the witch, but you're wielding the magic spell. Thing. All right, Jason, carry on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the question of divine agency is a fascinating one because we we talk about this all the time, right? Like, just because a god has helped doesn't mean that the god is responsible, but it also mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you're not responsible. Mm-hmm. And it's this it's just a very interesting line to walk um that I think the Greeks were very comfortable with. Um mm-hmm. in general, like yeah, 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 like you can still do terrible things because a god made you. But like that's still kind of on you. Mm-hmm. Even though we recognize like that the god was involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Man. Now, Medea, Medea is delightful, uh, especially in the Argonautica. Um, mm-hmm. Have you have you read Circe? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I would be surprised if you had not. So one of the one of the things I just mwah, love about it is how much she mined the Argonautica mm-hmm. for the interactions between Circe and Medea. Like picked up on so many small details, but one of the ones I just loved was that when Medea goes to to Circe's island. And it's like, okay, I like kind of screwed up. I did, I did murder my brother, um, and I need to be ritually purified. Obviously, Cersei does this, but like a minor detail is that Cersei talks with Medea in Colchian. Mm. So this it's very much like you, Medea, brought this boy to my island. We're going to speak in our own language. I do not give a shit that this guy cannot follow the conversation because he does not matter to me. And you're just like, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Um, she sees Jason for what he really is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I'm not even sure she directly addresses Jason in that scene. Like he's there and dealt with, but like, as in most other heroic business, we'd be talking to the guy. No, 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 no. Yeah. So good. Mm-hmm. So good. Yeah, that's fascinating. No, but I just, yeah, I mean, Medea is so fascinating because her in Ovid is also one of my favorites mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. she she rides that ger- dragon chariot so much in Ovid in a way that she does not elsewhere. Yeah. And it's like, you know, take what you will about original sourcing and, or, you know, not original, but older sourcing and whatever Ovid made up and for yeah. all his stuff. I, I will take her riding around in a dragon chariot. Like, I mean... It, yeah, it's. I, I covered that in a recent. Well, I recently re aired them, thankfully, after the Argonautica while I was away. Um, but I did Medea episodes last year or the year before, even maybe. I don't know. Time is a flat circle. Right. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I say that all the time. All the time. <laughs> I mean, especially now. I yes. did that pre pandemic, and now I'm like, yes. well, now it's just true. just true. Like, what is time? I have no idea. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, and I. I for the first time, I really went through the the Ovid sections on her, and they're just so incredible. I mean, what she does to Peleus's grand or daughters, yep. and Peleus in general, yep. and the Dragon Chariot, like it's just some of Ovid's best. And I feel like it's yeah. not often referenced amidst the Metamorphoses. I think because Euripides is so famous, yeah. And of course, like, I mean, I live for Euripides' take on her too, but but Ovid's is so unique yeah. and gives such different insight into, like, it's almost her witchiest take. Yeah. Like, the witchiest version of her, I think, is in Metamorphoses. Yeah, no, it's it's so good. Um, <laughs> yeah, Ovid deeply loves Medea. 
and I am so sad we don't have his play. Mm-hmm. Uh, right? Like oh I. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I spoke about that recently. I yeah. you know just was reminded looking on a list of lost things. I was like, oh my god! Like, yeah. And I think Euripides wrote a Cadmus, and I'm like, between those two things, I just incredible. want them more than life itself. <laughs> Would be incredible. But Ovid's also got this way of humanizing her. Mm-hmm. So in his lesser known Heroides, which they're not that great. Some of them are interesting. Like I think I've done the Medea one and Penelope. You know, they've got, yeah, they've got yeah. some interesting pieces in them. Yeah. And I think the construct is inter- interesting. Like the fact that he did that, mm-hmm. that alone is enough for me, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I should clarify. my. I don't know if my listeners are fully familiar with the Herodes because I haven't covered them a ton. But oh, Ovid please. wrote a series of letters. Like they're letters from women to the men who kind of fucked with them. So there's yeah. like a letter from Medea to Jason. There's a letter from Hypsipyle to Jason, which is the ones I think I have kind of covered. Penelope to Odysseus, Dido to Aeneas, the Sappho one we can pretend didn't exist. Correct. Um, yeah. So it just but a fascinating kind of just construct in general that he decided to write these things. Yeah. Um, and what I love, I love that you've covered um, both the Hypsipyle and the Medea is because we get to see in like Medea, I think a a rather humanized, almost elegiac version of this sort of love struck woman who's been wronged. And we know we, the reader know like what she's capable of, but she seems very much just like a normal woman who has been horribly wronged by a man. You're like, yeah, we I'm on board. Uh, And then hearing Hypsipyle talk about her, it's very much to like, Oh, that barbarian witch. So it's clearly like Ovid being aware of like this, this is a person who's got different flavors and depending mm-hmm. on who's telling the story, she's going to be a different character, which I love. I genuinely mm-hmm. love. Um, it's very easy to sort of pick an author and be like, oh, in X, Medea does this. You're like, nah, he's going to give you different versions, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's so cool. Love it. Well, and she's one of the most complex characters, I think, because both because of her character and because of all the different versions we have of her yes. from all the different people over the years. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned the dragon cherry. I, I'm mm-hmm. going to ask this question not knowing the answer. Mm-hmm. There's the famous image of her on what I think is like a Sicilian I can't remember the name of the pot. It's a big pot. Mm-hmm, but um, pottery, yep. Yes. Riding a dragon tree. Do you have any mm-hmm. sense of the date for that? I bet you Theoi can tell me really quick. Cause... Right. Like, I think that gives mm-hmm. us some sort of insight into like, okay, this was relatively early on. Um, well, I mean, and it, it is in Euripides too. Yes, right. So that alone. So there's at least this this concept of her as this, mm. Yeah. Badass witchy person. The pottery, fourth century, actually. Ooh, okay. Yeah. But I think, I mean, this might even be more so based than off of Euripides. Sure. Well, great. I am very happy that that Medea is one of your favorites. I mean, she's she's, best. She's fantastic. Um, And I think it's in the Argonautica where we get this sort of tour of the world as she just flies from place to place collecting all the stuff she needs. That's in Ovid. That's an Ovid. That's in that's the Ovid Thank Dragon you. Chariot that I love there so much. There we are. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. It's so extensive and fascinating. That I yeah. mean, yeah, it's I think it's while she's collecting the things to then <laughs> completely take out Peleus' daughters. Yes. And yeah, and you it's in there's it's so extensive and it's visceral and weird. And yeah, it, she sort of tours around mm-hmm. collecting all of these things from mm-hmm. her dragon chariot. A delight. Um, have you covered my favorite spooky witch, uh, Canidia? No. Okay. No. And that's what I would love from you because sure. I've even seen it's in, she's in your Twitter bio. She is. Uh, I'm, I'm obligated to talk about her because yeah. I wrote a, a whole ass book about her. Um, there we go. They said it couldn't be done. <laughs> and I do mean literally multiple presses said <laughs> <laughs> we don't want a book just about Canidia. Uh, but someone eventually said yes. So Canidia is weird in that she shows up in six poems by Horace. Hmm. Um, and honestly, a lot of people don't read Horace much, so it's not surprising that she's flown underneath the radar. And if you have read Horace, you're like, yeah, 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 the Carpe Diem, cool, cool, got it, nice. So Horace, writing his stuff, yeah, he has this recurring character. 
um, which for a not real, I put quotation marks around that, um, person, it's odd that she shows up so much. Mm-hmm. Um, Horace is frequently talking about like a wide cast of characters in his social ambit. And you're like, great, you, you keep seeing some of the same faces, but Canidia keeps popping up. Mm-hmm. And she does weird things, obviously. The weirdest, okay, not, no, we'll just go with the weirdest, is she is conducting some sort of spell in a graveyard, except it's not quite a graveyard. It used to be a graveyard. Now it's like a, a pleasure garden. Yeah. Quite a reversal. <clears throat> There's been some, uh, some urban renewal slash gentrification in Rome, and Horace's patron, Mycenas, has redone this space. It used to be like a, a graveyard for the poor. Um, you're just going to be dumped here. And you're like, oh, okay, that's not, that's not great. Um, so yes, and now it's been, been refurbished. Um, and unfortunately, Canidia keeps showing up there like doing witchy shit. She's like, to me, it's still a graveyard. Correct. And right, almost certainly those bones would have still been there. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> this this wasn't, this wasn't, I cannot imagine. You're like, no, 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 we'll lay these all carefully to rest elsewhere. Like, mm-mm, no. I mean, they probably wouldn't do that for like even sort of more middle class, let alone if yeah. it's a graveyard for the poor. Yeah. Yeah. So Canidia shows up and is... Like she's digging up bones and she's digging into the ground. She's doing a lot of things that some old school scholars are like, okay, I think we can pinpoint the precise magical thing. She said, no, you cannot. This is this is an absurd, fantastic pastiche that's just to be like, Canidia is very scary and like she's burying things in the ground and that's weird. You're like, okay, fine. Um, but the whole, I say this is weird because the whole poem is narrated by a talking statue of Priapus. <laughs> okay. um, would you care to explain to uh, your dear listeners uh, why that's so funny, in case they're not on board? Yeah. I mean, I can't even tell you necessarily what he's the official god of, but he's just the guy who walks around with like a two-foot-long erect Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. He's associated with any number of things, fertility being high I've, among them. Yeah. Yeah. There's one, um, it's a wall, maybe a yeah, wall painting or something. Mm-hmm. Yep. Where In he's Pompeii. He, yep. It's um being held up by a scale. Or yeah. Like like they're weighing it. Yeah, he's weighing his massive cock against just a like bushel of um, <laughs> I believe it's like fruits and vegetables. It lives in my mind because I've yeah. seen it like once and it's like, well, I'll never forget that image. Yeah. If you want to ever see it, I believe it's the House of the Vedii in Pompeii. Very famous for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you just search Priapus, like you're <laughs> going to find yeah. it. It'll, it'll pop yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> Among other things <laughs> that will yeah. pop up. Indeed. So yeah, this this statue is narrating the whole thing. Wow. Correct. It's <laughs> odd. And then at the end... All right, so the other thing that Priapus does is, um, in addition to sort of being a god associated with fertility, which is why you might want him in a garden, great, excellent. Mm -hmm. Being Ithophallic, he is also a a guardian, right? He's going to protect space. Um, And so you'll you'll see these, these huge statues in gardens with warnings that are obscene. (laughs) The Romans were, were obscene. Correct. That's a but moral of the story, too. These are explicitly saying, like, if you come into my garden, like, this statue will physically assault you. And depending on your bits, it's going to go this way, this way, or this way. And you're like, wow, you really spelled that one they out. They lay okay. it out. Wow. Lay it all out. So, like, don't take the cucumbers. <laughs> all right. Fine. Got it. Um, so this, this statue is in a like position of defense, but also like is just a statue. Um, So it's angry about Canidia doing her thing. And so the end of the poem happens when the statue farts. And then Canidia and her friend Sagana, they're shocked and their teeth fall out and their wigs fall off and they, they go run. Maybe it's not their teeth, whatever. Like they're, (laughs) they lose some accoutrement, certainly a wig um, and go running off back into the city. And you're like, ha, 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 there was a witch, but 
the farting statue of Priapus, drove them away. Is yep. this supposed to be scary or funny or both? I think it's supposed to be funny. Uh, like, there's no way it... Certainly the ending is highly comedic. Well, yeah. This characterization of her really seems like a let's make fun of this person. Because um, mm-hmm. she's invoking Cersei in some ways, but, like, she's a dime store Cersei. Mm-hmm. Um, she's invoking the witches of Theocritus and Virgil, but is also a dime store version of them too, right? Like, so at every turn, she's just not living up to the people she's trying to be and then mm-hmm. gets chased off by a fart. That's why I was like, okay, I need to, I need to <laughs> write about this. My dissertation yeah. was supposed to be about like five witches and I got into chapter one and I was like, oh, okay, this is what's happening. It's all about her, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The actual like scary bit is in his Epodes. This is Epode 5 uh, for anyone who cares. Um, people so, like Horus. I'm sure people care. Hooray. <laughs> um, she and like three of her witch buddies have caught a young Roman boy. And they have buried him alive in what seems to be their house. And they're going to starve him to death. So they can make a love potion out of his organs. Ooh. Mm-hmm. It's pleasant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's pretty creepy. Um there are some comedic moments, like one of Canadia's friends is like grunting as she's digging the hole, and you're like, okay, I guess that's a little funny. But I view the like at the end of the day, if you are burying a child and starving him to death like that's that's not yeah, really I think, funny no it seems like that like is sort of the polar opposite of a story of her being yeah buried yeah. by perhaps correct um but like i have have disagreed in print uh with scholars who are like how can you possibly read this as horrific i'm like did we read the same poem i feel like we read the same poem because mm-hmm. uh, at the the end is delightful and horrifying when this boy gives an impassioned speech um it's not a speech that like an eight-year-old should be able to give but we're gonna overlook that (laughs) and it's essentially like all right you're gonna kill me but when i die i'm gonna come back as a night fiend and i'm gonna terrorize you in your sleep and also my parents whom you all have forced to like outlive their children, they're going to come after you and they're going to essentially stone you to death as you're running through the streets. And you're like, okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's high comedy right there. <laughs> so creepy, right? This is. Yeah, I would argue that one's a creepy one. Canadia is absolutely yeah. great for, for spooky season. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and those are her most, I would say most creepy ones. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of the other ones, it's okay. So the big question is, who the hell is this woman? Why is mm. Horace writing about her six times? Yeah, uh, three times. She's clearly an in joke, right? She shows up for like two lines. That's it. And it's like, oh my god, did Canidia breathe on this? Gross. <laughs> okay, neat. Like, do you expect that we know your poetry, Horace, or like, are we best buds and you know who we're making fun of? Like, what's going on? Mm-hmm. The best scholarly, mm, not even consensus, just guess. The best scholarly guess, and these are from the scoliasts who are like, oh, if Horace said it, it must be true. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to piece together this woman's life. It's all hot garbage. But the, <laughs> this is at least what they suspect the actual committee is. Is they're like, okay, we know that poets would like change the names of people. So like... Clodia became Lesbia. Neat. So they're like, okay, Canidia, real name, Gratidia. Nailed it. Is that a real Roman name? No. Okay, good. At least Doesn't I don't think so. Like I have not good. run into it before. Lives in Naples, named Gratidia, sells perfume. Again, all of this is just people reading Horace's poetry and being like, there's a detail. It must be true. Got it. And then the kicker is because Horace has this later poem where he's 
essentially saying like, dear Canidia, I am so sorry for all the mean things I said about you. Not, will you please forgive me? I hate you. And then Canidia is essentially like, no, no. How about no? The Scoliath is also like, so obviously they were lovers. Definitely. And they broke up and it was bad. And so Horace wrote all these mean things. And now he's trying to sort of make moments, maybe. <laughs> it's wild. It is absolutely wild. But yeah, that is that is this creepy, weird little witch that is near and dear to my heart. Interesting. I mean, she sounds fascinating. She is. She yeah. is. And you can read all six poems in like under half an hour. So Cersei was, because mm-hmm. obviously Cersei, spooky season. Mm-hmm. Um, where do you come down on the all the animals on her island are used to be men? I love that idea. I'll admit I haven't given it like a ton of thought, but I would like to believe that's true. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I like it. I like <laughs> How about it. you? That's yes, I'm 100% there. Um, especially because it it gives such a macabre cast to Odysseus's first encounter wherein he like he kills the stag and you're like that mm-hmm. definitely used to be a dude and you fed him to your entire crew. Um, and it also That's makes, true. there's a like slight detail that the stag is like either wasn't running away as expected or was just, it was doing mm-hmm. something that was made it a touch easier to kill. And you're like, hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was a guy you murdered and ate. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's Odysseus. We Correct, it's him. Odysseus. Yeah. <laughs> totally fine. But no, I I absolutely love Cersei, and it's so unfortunate. Like that in the Odyssey, she doesn't really get to shine as much as a character you, you think she should be able to, because she's very much the like I'm here to help you. Okay, fine. She is at least because, of course, the Odyssey is like most of what we have. Yeah. Um, but she, she's still quite unique in it. Oh yeah. Just as a woman, enough that I'm like, okay, no, like I'm with you. You know, you know, she does stand up for herself. I appreciate that she's like, I won't do anything until we've already had sex. Like that's my that's where I draw the line. Yeah. Um, I also appreciate that it does also seem like Odysseus consents. You mm-hmm. know, I do want to make that clear. It doesn't, I, I don't take it as, like, I think Calypso down the line. It Oh, that's definitely became, compelled. It, there's yeah. like, yeah. But with Cersei, it seems like he's kind of looking at her and he's like, well, she doesn't seem so bad. She's kind of hot. Like, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And right, it's a little hard to argue that the guy who just pulled a sword is being coerced into something. Well, exactly. Yeah. It's like, you know, he probably could have forced her to transform his men without that. And yeah. meanwhile, he was like, well, sure, yeah. Oh, 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 shucks, that's what you want? Okay, well, only if you, that means you really will transform them back. She holds so much power, and she is, she is very unique when it comes to just, like, characters of women, you know, yeah. in myth of... She gets what she wants. She, you know, she really does sort of draw the lines. And she, aside from the moment where Hermes like, inexplicably helps Odysseus defeat her in yeah. some kind of way. Absolutely. Which is such an odd moment. It doesn't really fit, mm-hmm. you know? It's a, yeah, it's a weird little bit. I was talking about that with somebody else I was recording with the other day as well. Because, I mean, it's interesting in Madeline Miller's Cersei that she makes that based in a relationship between yeah. them um but yeah i mean it is it is an odd moment in the odyssey regardless and yeah. like i don't think and i don't know if you know this at all but i don't think there's any textual evidence to suggest that cersei and hermes ever had a thing. No, no 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 i don't think so i think that was a very clever interpretation by miller mm-hmm. yeah 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 because it works it makes it work it gives you or it yeah. 
gives you a reason why Hermes would be there versus just like, hey, I'm going to help you, which of course is sort of its own reason in Greek myth of a god's going to help a hero because a god's going to help a hero. Correct. Correct. Right. Which then gets us back to, as you were talking about, the the sort of divine agency. We could be like, oh, like Odysseus did overcome Circe. Like, I mean, mm. not, not really. Not no. really. Hermes did. But like reflected. Yeah. It's all it's all yeah, mixed like, up in there. What would have happened to Odysseus if Hermes hadn't just happened to come in and say, like, here's this moly. Like, yeah. Go with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, death. Death is what happens. Yeah. And that would have been, I mean, a, sort of, I guess, a sad en- end to the very beginning of <laughs> yeah. the Odyssey. And thus we have to have Hermes come in and help out. Hecate is so interesting because she really is like... I want her to have so much more. Mm-hmm. You know, I talked about how <laughs> I'm certainly not hiding anything when it comes to her. There yeah. isn't anything, but she just really seems like there should be so much there as this idea of the goddess of witches, but also crossroads and, you know, various other things. And she's, she's a chthonic deity. She lives in the underworld, but she also, I think we're supposed to assume spent a lot of time on the upper world before Persephone went to the underworld. You know, yeah. she's she takes place or she takes a part in the Homeric Kim to Demeter as like sort of helping Demeter find Persephone and then staying with Persephone in the underworld. I don't know. Mm. It's an interesting thing. So I'm going to plug Dr. Ellie Roberts here. Have you mm-hmm. talked with her yet? I have. Yeah. Okay. Way back. Actually. How did she I miss this? She was one of my first. Oh, she came on and talked Persephone. Oh, my God. I was and just like, about to say, you should talk one with of the her best about Persephone. Episodes. Oh, okay. gosh. No. Yeah. She's she's definitely was a part of one of everyone's favorite episodes. Okay, fantastic. She came in and talked about the Persephone cult in um for uh, Locris. Oh, okay, um, yeah, the Locris and cult, the sure, Persephone sure. cult there because there's a lot of like really interesting things suggesting that women really identified with her, and you know some identified with her as if she went with Hades consensually, and some went the other way, and mm-hmm. oh, utterly fascinating from That's like a awesome. real yeah real person perspective. Fantastic, great, yes. well. Wonderful. You got that covered. I was like, yeah. she should really be able to talk a lot about this. Oh, gosh. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So beyond Hecate and her, all her mm-hmm. amazingness, and God, I really do wish we could, like, we will never get this information, but if we could sort of untangle, like, okay, what what was going on underworld-wise? Like, mm-hmm. who was who was down where, according to whom, doing what? Yeah. Would be lovely. Yeah. What did it really look like? Like, what did they, or what did they picture it looking like? Mm. Because that's super... I mean, it's like clear if you want to say clear, but like it's, you know, certain people talked about certain things, but there's not a lot of Greek sourcing on it beyond the names of the rivers and that one was the main river. Yeah. And then any other kind of visuals, you're more so into Virgil. And then it's like, well, what was Virgil basing it off of? We don't know if that connects to the Greek at all. And yeah, yeah. I guess we've got the Plato's myth of Ur, which I want to say is late in the Republic. Hmm. What does he talk about? Because I don't usually um, go to Plato for myths. As Completely reasonable. <laughs> um, but no, I think, um, God, I'm not a Plato guy, but I'm relatively positive this is in the Republic, wherein this guy named Ur talks about going to the underworld. Or maybe it's Socrates hmm. talking about, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Anyway, we discuss being in the underworld and resurrection. Uh, and the like, you get to choose the sort of new life you want um, to inhabit. Mm -hmm. And so it's all an endorsement of philosophy because like those who have like truly understood knowledge and what it is to investigate a thing can best look at the, the new life they're going to inhabit and make the best decisions. But Mm -hmm. still like we've got discussions of reincarnation, which Mm -hmm. generally people don't think about in terms of ancient Greece. Not at all. No, that's really interesting. Yeah. But one of the the exercises I like to do when folks are talking in class and they're like, so wait, what did it look like? Mm-hmm. Um, what did they imagine? And so we're like, okay, cool. What we're going to do is we've got a class of like 20 people, all of whom, like if they are not Christian, have at least grown up in or spent a considerable amount of time in sort of Christian-dominated United States in the 21st century. Well, yeah. I mean, Canada is exactly the same, right? In North America, you get... Like, I'm not remotely Christian or religious or anything, and I feel like I've gotten enough information. To yeah, like, there's enough ambient noise. That you're <laughs> yeah. like, great, got it. And so you're like, okay, everybody, like, let us try to 
like write down how we understand either hell or heaven, like pick one. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, even with everybody all in the same room with very similar backgrounds, as far as this goes, again, even if you have nothing to do with Christianity personally, like you've absorbed it. Um, yeah. Even then you're like, you've got wildly disparate ideas. Like some folks are going with the like angels and the halos and the hanging out on, on clouds and other folks are like, no, it's some completely different thing. It's just white space or maybe there's not actually heaven. And you're like, okay, great. So we can't agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like largely we're coming in the same place, trying to come up with a diachronic explanation of what would have worked for Greeks over a course of centuries or millennia, let alone from city state to city state. You're like, mm -hmm. mm -mm. just, mm -hmm. just try to pin down like, what did this person at this one point over here think? Yeah. yeah. But even that we don't really have much, which no. is what's so interesting. No. Right? It's like, I don't know if they didn't want to talk about it or if they didn't think about it or they just didn't write it down. Or I mean, they what, definitely but... talked about it or definitely wanted to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, right. Cause it's, it, it seems to dominate so much, uh, at least in terms of mystery cults, right? Like there's yes. so much out there true. where like, we should be all like concerned with the underworld. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. The mystery cults alone, but then they're even more mysterious. Correct. Unfortunately. Correct. Those damn things. <sighs> I know. I've been looking into the Samothracian mystery cult lately. Which I know nothing about. Please tell me. So, I mean, I can't find a ton. I mean, it's just generally fascinating because it was, I didn't even know about it at all. Like, I've literally never about... heard of it. The only thing I know about there Samothrace is there's the winged Nike of Samothrace. Yes, which is, turns out, if you Google Samothrace, it's 90% Nike. And I'm like, okay, but what if I want to know about the island? <laughs> and they're like, nope, just sh here's the Louvre. And I'm like, fuck <laughs> off. Um, yeah, so no, the Samothracian mystery cult was the second biggest mystery cult next to a Lucinian. Excuse me, what? Thank you. I'm glad I'm not the only one who learned no. this and was like, what the actual fuck? No. Second biggest. It was enormous they say the argonauts were inducted most of the buildings that we know of are hellenistic so maybe it's just that it was super late like it looks like i think i don't know if it was the philip that's alexander's dad or just another philip sure there's a lot of philips in macedon yeah, yeah. but th they built a lot they did a, there's like a lot of macedonian work and helen from the hellenistic period and everything on samothrace Huh. But in top of uh, like just in terms of the mystery cult, they had this enormous temple complex sanctuary, which has like eight buildings. It's huge and is like mostly like an archaeological site now, like huge amounts to find. Um, and yeah, so second biggest mystery cult, it was associated primarily with uh, like the sea and sailors. So if you wanted to like have a good I guess life on the sea to be sure. you know, blessed by Poseidon, I guess, you know, you're getting inducted into the Samothracian mystery cult. They also, I think it made it easier to then get inducted into the Eleusinian too. Great. Excellent. Yeah. I want to get one free. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, because of how close Samothrace was to Lemnos, it's super associated with Hephaestus, even though it seems like the purpose was safety for sailors but is Lemnos the place that what's his face gets abandoned as well? Yes. And also generally is just like Hephaestus's island. Okay. Wait, so, why is it volcanic? I don't think so. Huh. It's weird. I don't know, but it's like even in the um it's in the story in the Odyssey. Was it Odyssey or the Iliad? Where it's like the side story where um, Hephaestus catches Aphrodite and Ares. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah. When he angrily storms off, he goes to Lemnos. And that's where he says, like, he that's how he tricks them, too. He's like, I'm going to Lemnos, you know, pretends to leave. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And catches them. So, it, but yeah, so there was this whole... The like Kabiroi, which are these the two yes. mystery gods of Hephaestus, they're really deep in the Samothracian mystery cult. Huh. It's fucking fascinating. Huh. Is that yeah. where we so we've got those weird um Kabiroi vases? Oh um, with I don't think I know about them. Oh, okay. So if at least if I remember correctly. So yeah, there are these vases referred to as the Kabiroi vases, um that depict among other things, Odysseus and Circe. Oh, interesting. And their comic 
in oh. that Cersei is like sort of an old crone and Odysseus has got a pot belly and his dick's hanging down to his knees. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Well, I wrote those down. Yeah. Um, That's I'm fascinating. Pretty, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious how they would then link up to, cause the Kabir are supposed to be, well, and I think there's a lot of different interpretations of them because they're mystery gods. Yeah, I believe that. But they're like possibly the sons of Hephaestus twins. And then sometimes they're connected with, Castor and Polyduques and yeah, that that part of twins because it seems like they're allowed they're on, the only twins that are allowed to exist in ancient yeah. Greece. Yeah, so there's others sometimes, but yeah, that's really interesting. But yeah, yeah. no, Samothrace is like turns out it's unreal and it's this tiny silly little island, and so now I'm obsessed with going and seeing the sanctuary. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And but I don't know how we got here. Mystery cults. I that's suppose. totally fun. That's totally fine. But, but yeah, the, you're right. The underworld, the the idea of picturing the underworld certainly would have been important to the mystery cult. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I did have another uh, brainwave uh, about mm. another witch who is also decidedly creepy. Great. Um, Meraway in Apuleius's Metamorphoses. Oh yes. Yeah. So I have I have considered covering this. Okay. In the past. Okay. Um, but I'm going to not recall the details, just the level of b- problematic that it is mm-hmm. made me go, I'm not going to try to do a whole episode on this, but I would love to t- to be reminded and talk about it because yeah. it's certainly easier in a conversation setting. Yeah. So, so as a teacher and as someone who's read these things many times before, I should I should have known better. Um, I remembered, oh, there are some like vaguely sketchy things in this. I think we read most of this for one of my classes. But one day I, I showed up to class and my students are like, <clears throat> you know, it would have maybe been a good idea to give us a heads up about like <laughs> the explicit A, bestiality, and B, pedophilia that was in this book. And I was like, mm-hmm. Now it's all coming back to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I had uh, a whole plan to do an episode and then I start reading it and I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a little there's a, you, sh- you need to you need to know what you're getting into. You need to mm-hmm. know what you're getting into. Um, and it's not all like that, but there's enough that you can't just be like it's great. Yeah. yeah. Fortunately, none of that in the Maraway section. Um, Perfect. Where she is essentially she's put into the stereotype of the lusty innkeeper. Um, which I was not aware was a stereotype, but my grad's my grad school advisor was like, yeah, yeah, yeah this is a thing. I was like, good, good to know, friend. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but yeah, the the lusty innkeep or the lusty innkeep's wife, either one, uh, but she is the innkeep, and she like starts having this relationship with a guy named Socrates, not that Socrates, but you're clearly kind of supposed to think about that Socrates, but not mm. him. And in the course of this relationship, like. Socrates' life just falls to shit. Like he's unwashed. He's becoming emaciated. Like his buddy finds him just like, I don't know if he's sitting beside the road or just like not doing well. And Socrates then confesses to his friend that like he wasn't in good straits. And then like he started sleeping with Meraway and really it all went downhill. So that currently he's like penniless and everything he does get, he gives to Meraway. Okay, that's that's maybe not great. He's also abandoned a wife and child back home to be with this oh, woman. Lovely. Like it's it's not good. Um, and so his new buddy is like, hey, maybe let's get you back on your feet. Let's let's kind of get you moving again. It doesn't it doesn't work. It does not work terribly well. <laughs> Because Socrates is like, look, Meraway, Meraway has powers. You can't just like talk shit about this woman. She's going to get you. Um, that is, in fact, the case. Because we hear that Meraway has the ability to like turn people into animals. And the people who have wronged her, she like has terrible things happen to them, right? So like some woman, I don't know, was mean to her or whatever, was maybe a rival, uh, maybe a sexual rival. I can't remember. Either way, she was forced to like remain pregnant for years. Um, yeah, or someone else she turned into a beaver because, at least according to the Romans, when beavers are threatened, they gnaw off their own testicles. Um, 
such that anyone who's pursuing them will be like, ooh, goodies, and stop chasing the beaver. I love Roman science. <laughs> it's so, so close, yet so far. <laughs> Right, so we just get so many tales uh, of Meroe being kind of a badass, uh, and Socrates being like, "Yeah, it's not. It's kind of. I'm kind of stuck." Um, so his buddy is like, "Fine, I'm gonna break you out. It's gonna be fine." And then in the middle of the night, Meroe and her friend, another witch, like come in. They they stab Socrates like they cut his throat um, in the middle of the night, and then like drain out all of his blood. And then they take a sponge and they're like, it's going to be fine. And they just shove it down through the hole uh, that they've stabbed into his throat. Um, and they're like, it's fine. Everything's going to be fine. Uh, you'll wake up. Ta -da. Oh, and then to add insult to injury, these two women also then like crouch over Socrates' friend and just like pee all over him. <laughs> um, yes. Like it's a, it's a whole thing. I'm sure if anyone wanted to do a Freudian reading of this, it would be completely possible. Um, and then they leave. It's great. Uh, and then the room just goes back to the way it was. Socrates' buddy eventually wakes up in the morning and is like afraid that his friend is dead. And it's like, all right, here's the deal. I'm essentially staying at a Motel 6, but in the ancient world. And my roommate got murdered by witches. Like, how do I explain this? So like he tries to leave and the doorman is like, no one's leaving. It's like, it's not even, it's not even daytime. Like you cannot leave. What if you murdered your roommate? And the guy's like, Okay. All right. Fine. Thinks about killing himself. That falls apart because actually I believe he does try to hang himself and then the rope breaks and he falls on Socrates and then Socrates wakes up. Socrates wakes up. And is like, what are you doing? You smell like piss. Um, so it's, it's a funny tale. Um, and then these two like go off about their business right up until the point that Socrates like tries to take a drink from a river and then suddenly the the story is all true again, right? The the sponge pops out of the hole and Socrates is dead. And you're like, okay, cool. It's a great, great time. Wow. Yeah. That's it's just it's so many things. So many things. And it's like one of three really weird witch stories that happen in the first two books. That's the thing about that book. I mean, so I've, you know, I read Cupid and Psyche when I was real young. Yeah. I love Cupid and Psyche. I have revisited it. I definitely did not <laughs> give it the right amount of justice in terms of the the level of creepy that does actually exist within that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I I've read that a lot. Sure. And then even though there's definitely some like major weird consent issues that, you know, should be talked about, I did not and I I kind of want to go back, but I also don't. It's people's favorite episode. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But, you know, besides that, like, it's still pretty normal and nice. And it's it's quite a lovely story. And then the rest of that book is wild. Bad shit insane. Yes. I've 100%. only tried to read bits of it. And I'm like, what is this? <laughs> like, how is this the book that contains yeah. Cupid and Psyche? So here's the thing. So first... First, you probably maybe already talked about this in your episode. Did you talk about Beauty and the Beast? I, I don't remember if I did. I mean, I know that Beauty and the Beast is based yeah. on Cupid and Psyche for sure. Which as I, soon as yeah. you start making critiques of that, you're like, oh, oh, wait a second. Mm -hmm. um, delightful. Anyway, wonderful. Great. You're on the same page. So as I said, I'm not a philosophy guy, but people smarter than I am have been like, okay, so here's the deal with Happy Laius. He is a Neoplatonist. And what he has done is in the center of this, I think it's 11 book novel, in the dead center of this, stretching from books four to five to six, you've got this long ass story of Cupid and Psyche, which can be read as an allegory for the immortality of the soul. Hmm. Mm hmm. Because Psyche, obviously Greek soul, great, got yeah. it. And so like she has to overcome all of these things to eventually leave behind her earthly trappings and then go be immortalized after suffering a death in the underworld. Like it's there is a philosophical reading to be made uh, of that text. I am not endorsing it 100 percent, but it does at least go some way to being like, what the fuck is this doing here? And yeah. why did you put so much importance on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, it 
it feels very out of place. I mean, again, I haven't read the rest of it, but I've like, you know, read little bits in and around it. It, But it feels, it feels out of place. It's yeah. definitely surrounded by weirdly bizarre things. And, you know, of course, the, the consent issues would not have really been an issue back then. Correct. So it would have been even more out of place. It would have been even mm-hmm. more like, this is a beautifully romantic tale Correct. in the midst of utter nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. And even more nonsensical is the final book where it's just a like detailed description of what would appear to be initiation rites into the cult of Isis. You know, oh. Book 11 is bananas. Wow. Yes, and so the lot a lot of scholars have done work on this and they're like what like is this like you're actually revealing mysteries is that legit? Is this satire? What's happening mm. here? Yeah. Um, book 11 is absurd. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Yes. I, I mean, <laughs> so it's such yeah. a weird book. It's such a weird book. Yeah. Now, back to the witch in it. Yes, um, please. Because as you were talking about it, I just kept thinking like, so, I mean, how much do we think, certainly these types of witches, you know, the Roman, I would say specifically, mm-hmm. The Greek is harder because they span mythology in a different way. Yeah. Um, but how much are these women sort of, or these witches, commentary on women, basically? Oh, like, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think one of my standard bylines when we're, when we're reading ancient texts is that the vast majority of what we're reading is written by elite men for elite men about elite men. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, so it's r- really hard to extricate discussions or um, sort of snapshots of women from that context because you're like, yeah, like even even if you have sort of the most well-intentioned Roman author, like this is still very much being produced by Roman men. Again, largely for Roman men. Mm-hmm. Um, Which is what leads me to say like or just imagine that these women are sort of like in jokes of like, uh wives right god they can be so much like they're always trying to trick me or yeah you know poison me or i don't know all these different things like it just feels like yeah it feels like an in-joke commentary on that's certainly their that's opinions. certainly a read um and not one that i disagree with um i will say i i had a very uh pointed and cogent critique of some of my work by i don't know how she pronounces her last name pauline rapat i believe um, and one of the things that she pointed out is that underneath a lot of these stories um, about witches and beyond the literature, like actual like evidence we've got of, of on the ground magical practice, mm. what we can see is a demonstration of actual anxiety by women about the lives and relationships um, that they had. Mm-hmm. Um, and so even if we've got sort of many layers of, of patriarchy and misogyny to sort of pull back, what we can see in a lot of these instances is like a genuine concern um, about like their day-to-day lives. Now, Meraway, not so much, um, unless you like really want to squint hard and be like, okay, concern about other romantic partners running a business. Because one of the things she's concerned about is people who are sort of competing uh, in her economic market. Um, so that men would be concerned that women would use their magic while she's like, okay, I see what you're doing here, buddy. Yeah. Um, but no, on the face of it, you were, you were absolutely correct. That a lot of this is just guys projecting their own anxieties. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's just interesting. Also, I, <laughs> I kept thinking too, like at the beginning at least, but does, does that make, Cersei, a lusty innkeeper? I think some people would absolutely argue that she would fall into that category. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. certainly at the beginning. I mean, she does house them for a year. Yeah. And indeed. she starts things off with, all right, I'm going to get some and then mm-hmm. I'm going to help you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I kind of like it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, um, I mean, well, this has been a perfect conversation about witches i've learned so much about roman ones it's great because i really my sourcing on rome is not remotely as good as what i can find for greece happy to be of help 
Well, yeah. I mean, thank you so much for doing this. This has been really great. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Very happy to. What, um, where can listeners find you? You do TikTok, so you should promote the. Oh, that's true. Among other things. (laughs) Uh, So, um, I'm teaching at Earlham College, uh, down in Richmond, Indiana. Great place. Uh, And you can find me online on TikTok at Prof Maxwell. It's a really pretentious name, but it Mm. works fine. And on Twitter, I'm at Winaficus Ipsa. Yeah, with a V. Yep. Okay. That yep. one's a little harder to find, I would argue. That's why I renamed myself Prof Maxwell on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> smart. Smart. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so there we are. Uh, wonderful. And you have a book about Canidia. So that's I do. very cool. I yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm thrilled. This is the Canidia of Horace's Epode 5. Oh, whatever god above guides the world and the human race, what does this commotion mean? Why are all your cruel faces turned against me alone? I beg you by your children, if Lucina was invoked at their actual births by this futile band of purple, by Jupiter who is sure to condemn these acts, why do you gaze at me like a stepmother or like some wounded beast? The boy spoke with quavering lips, then grew quiet as the trappings of his youth were stripped away. His was the body of a child, youthful enough to soften even the godless hearts of the Thracians, yet Canidia, her unkempt hair bound with slender snakes, orders fig trees to be uprooted from tombs. She orders funereal cypress and a feather and eggs from a nocturnal strix, smeared with the blood of a hideous frog, and herbs that Iolcus and Hiberia, fertile in poisons, send forth and bones snatched from the mouth of a starving hound, all of these she orders to be burned in Colchian flames. In the meantime, Sagana immediately sprinkles water from Lake Avernus throughout the entire house, her bristling locks standing on end like a sea urchin or a running boar. Vaya, unrestrained by any sense of guilt, groans with exertion, and she digs up the earth with a firm mattock, so that the boy, buried in the pit, can be starved to death in sight of a meal that is renewed two or three times a day, while only his head projects from the earth like a swimmer whose chin just emerges from the water. She does this so that his dried liver and bone marrow can be made into a love potion just as soon as his pupils fixed on the forbidden food have melted away. If a Crimean folia, she with the lust of a man, were not in attendance, opulent Naples could not believe it, nor could any of the towns nearby, after the stars have been charmed by her Thessalian voice. She rips them from the sky along with the moon. Now, as fierce Canidia gnawed at her untrimmed thumb with a blackened tooth, what did she say or what did she leave unsaid? Night and Diana, not unfaithful overseers of my affairs, you who maintain silence when the sacred rites occur. Now, now be at hand, now turn your wrath and power against hostile homes. While the listless beasts sleep sweetly in the treacherous woods, the bitches of the Sabura bark at that adulterous old man, something everyone laughs at, smeared with an ointment whose better my hands have never fashioned. What happened? Why are the dire poisons of Medea the barbarian not working? With these she took her revenge and escaped that haughty concubine, the daughter of great Creon. With a cloak, a gift rubbed down with slime, she snatched the new bride away in flames. Yet no herb, no root hidden in a treacherous place escaped my notice. He sleeps in a bedchamber laced with the forgetfulness of all other mistresses. Ah, ah, he walks about, freed by the spell of a more powerful witch— 
Varus, you are soon to weep profusely, not through the use of my usual potions. Will you run back to me and your mind? Though summoned by Marcian chance, will not return. I will prepare something else, a better potion to pour upon you in your reluctance. And the sky will sooner sit beneath the sea with the earth stretched atop it before you fail to blaze with passion for me like bitumen in black flames. After this, the boy no longer sought to soften the godless women with gentle words, but doubtful as how to break the silence, sent forth Thyestean oaths. Magic poisons are not strong enough to confuse right and wrong or human vengeance. I shall pursue you terribly. My terrible hatred will be appeased by no sacrifice. Condemned to die when I breathe my last, I shall return, a fury of the night, and as a shade I shall claw at your face with hooked talons. This is the power of the gods of the dead, and sitting astride your restless hearts, I shall steal your sleep through fear." A crowd attacking you hideous old women with rocks will stone you street by street, and afterwards the wolves and the birds of the Esquiline will tear apart your unburied limbs, and the sight will not escape the notice of my parents, alas, who were forced to survive me. Oh, nerds, thank you all so much for listening to that conversation and the very fun reading of that poem after. It was so creepy and good. Uh, So thank you to Maxwell for letting me read that. It was very exciting. Uh, Thank you all so much for listening. As always, this is so much fun. I love these conversations. I love that I get to talk about spooky season with people. It's just... It's really cool and fun, and I'm glad you all seem to like it as much as I do. Ah, Happy fucking spooky season. Happy Halloween. Please, if you're up for it, watch Scream for me, would you? I am Liv, and I love this shit.